a great pleasure to welcome Professor Perry Merling from uh, Barnard College, Columbia University, and uh, also uh, from the Institute for New Economic Thinking. Uh, Perry is a financial economist, uh, and um, I think it's particularly wonderful that he's able to come here because, um, and, and for me personally, it's, it's a great thing that he's able to come here because when the financial crisis happened in 2008, I was in New York and I was, I was, it really struck me how few people either A, knew it was happening or B, had a clue about how to, to think about it. You know, even just, just having a kind of mental map of, of what was going on because people were utilizing categories that they had developed over the 20 years before. I think you heard Professor Stiglitz say that um, uh, macroeconomics was made uh, in the last 20 years for a period in which there was no instability. And so how do, how do you handle and think about uh, periods of instability? That, that was not really part of the general um, uh, discussions at that point of time. And what was really wonderful, a lot of people at that point of time gravitated towards um, Perry, because Perry Merling had one of the few kind of worked out answers about what was happening and how one might think about these, these matters. Um, and so, um, specifically, uh, he, he has a conception which, is, which comes from uh, monetary history, institutionalism, and a very different way of thinking about the macroeconomy than um, you would have heard before, and I, I'm sure he will go into it um, uh, in greater detail. And you, you, Perry was telling me yesterday, rather Judy was telling me yesterday, that, that uh, for Perry it's been a good crisis because he has actually, his ideas have now come to the fore. So it's a great pleasure to welcome Professor Perry Merlin. Thank you. Thank you for, for inviting me, Arjun. Um, it is, uh, people have been asking me the last couple of days, um, so uh, uh, how, how many times have you been to India? Well, this is it. Yeah, this is it right here. Uh, Bangalore is my introduction to India. Arjun says it's a soft introduction to India. So uh, it's been a very, very pleasant couple of couple of days, um, and I met many of you going to Mysore uh, on my second day in India. Uh, so uh, now this is the reason that I'm here. Um, financial globalization and stability. Um, uh, Arjun called me said just in this introduction um, said I was a financial economist. So let me just tell you a little bit about the kind of financial economist I am. Okay, because I'm not uh, your average. Um, so this is sort of who I am in a way. Um, it, this is an image. Uh, this is the first book I wrote here. Um, I wrote a history of American monetary economics, the money interest and the public interest from 1920 to 1970, which is about three biographies of three professors of, mon of monetary economics in that period. So it's sort of a history of monetary events and the response of these professors to it over that, over that period. Um, and then, so there's a history of money, and then here is a history of finance. This is a biography of Fisher Black. So this is taking the story from 1970 to the present, basically. It's the rise of modern finance. So there's history of money, history of finance. But I've never actually taught those subjects. I've always taught money and banking. And I've taught it out of this textbook here, Stigum, which is, I put as a further foundation, uh, Money Markets, which is a desk reference for people who trade the money markets. So it's a course that I teach that's all about how repo works and euro dollar markets and things like that. That's what I knew. That's what, uh, that's what broke okay, in this crisis. And so that's how come I knew stuff, because I was teaching, had been teaching out of this. This course, by the way, um, INET has filmed um, over just the last semester, and it's going to be a MOOC, one of these massive online open courses, um, as soon as we can get all permissions and get it edited and so forth. So it will be available um, to the world, hopefully. Um, that's in part of my INET life um, as director of education programs. We want to go into the online course business, and so I'm using myself as a guinea pig a bit to learn how to do that, so that then we can tell other people how to do it. Um, this, uh, this is the book that I wrote uh, in November of 2008, the third one here, The New Lombard Street, How the Fed Became the Dealer of Last Resort. Princeton Press came to me uh, in November of 2008, just about then, and said, it doesn't seem like people know what this crisis is about. Can you write a book that puts the crisis in historical perspective? And I said, sure. Okay. So that's the book there. Um, and uh, it's, it's not a history of monetary economics or finance. In a way, it's a biography of the Fed from, 2000, from, from 1913 to the present. Um, and uh, uh, there are other papers, too. And there's one, actually, that is on the Ning site uh, called uh, Financial Globalization of the Future of the Fed, um, which I don't know how many people have had. 
one or one or two maybe. I, actually, I should say, Perry, Perry was yeah. the one who set up uh, YSI, which all of you have now become part of. So, so that's another connection. Yeah, I'm going to say some things about YSI at the end. I have a few, a few sort of urging kind of slides there. Um, so this is sort of uh, who who I am, um, and this is not your standard introduction to. Uh, this is not the way people usually approach this. Uh, so it's it's sort of historical, institutional. Uh, background to thinking about money, and it's money and finance. You should know that money money tends to exist in economics departments, and finance tends to exist in business schools, and they don't sort of talk to each other. Um, and money was sort of pushed out of, of economics departments by DSGE when it seemed like, like we, there was no place for money there, so maybe we don't really need a course in money and banking. The reason I've been teaching the big money and banking course at Columbia was because no one else wanted to do it, actually. It's actually true that there was no course, and I I decided to offer one, and so I wasn't. Uh, no one said, "Well, I guess so," uh, and uh, but then it turned out that it was in fact important. So, financial globalization is in the title there. Um, I say the challenge of financial globalization. I mean here the intellectual challenge of, of financial globalization, because um, usually when we talk about globalization we tend to think about these things, supply chains, trade flows, labor mobility. But the, but the challenge from my point of view is that macroeconomics uh, <coughs> tends to be focused on the nation state. Okay? And when we talk about policy, we tend to think about uh, the boundaries of, of, of a country. And, and, and globalization is, is a challenge to that. It's a challenge to, in fact, the, the ability of the state to manage its own, its own, its own affairs. Um, and we'll come back to that. Um, the financial work, the financial piece of globalization is also a challenge. Um, we tend to think of capital markets, cross-border lending. We tend to think about real resources flowing here. Okay? But the, the part of the financial globalization that I'm interested in is really the financial part, okay? where there's gross flows, not, not necessarily net, net transfers. So when I say financial globalization, I'm focusing on the global dollar funding market, okay? how, how people fund themselves in the short term uh, money market, global, which is global, and is dollars. Okay, um, and that's the part where that is causing the crises. You know, the, the Asian financial crisis was largely caused by the fact that there was dollar lending to Asian banks um, that were then lending in local currencies um, long long term, and that became a banking crisis, it became a currency crisis. The shadow banking system was doing the very same thing, except in dollars on both sides. Okay, they were borrowing in the global money markets and lending. Uh, and lending long-term to, to, to U.S. households. So the global financial crisis of 2007-09, um, I see as, as, as the same kind of thing um, as the Asian financial crisis. Um, that's perhaps idiosyncratic, um, but let me explain why. So I think of so-called shadow banking as the characteristic institutional form of the current stage of financial capitalism, of, of this financial globalization stage. Okay, so that in order to understand financial globalization, we kind of have to understand shadow banking. It is sort of the characteristic form. Um, and when I say shadow banking, I don't mean things that are illegal or run by the mafia or something like that. I mean exactly this, okay? Money market funding of capital market lending. Money market funding of capital market lending. Um, not necessarily in, in intermediaries, in banks. Some of it might be in banks, depending on how their balance sheets work, okay? Whenever you see money market funding of capital market lending, that's the phenomenon that I'm interested in. Uh, and here are the three dimensions of that phenomenon that I want to want to highlight. One is that the that, that this is sort of global funding of local lending. Okay, the markets where where you're raising funds are global. Okay, and they're choosing projects. They're choosing where the money where the money goes, for and and maybe in local currencies as well. Okay, so that there could be currency currency risk here. Uh, this piece is going to be important, market pricing in both money and capital. So as opposed to our notions of banks, which are kind of customer markets, and you're thinking that they're, they may have some local monopoly for their deposit rates, and maybe local monopoly for lending rates. So these aren't really market prices in some sense. These are market prices, okay? There's a, there's a, there's a wholesale money market funding rate, okay, that's determined globally. And there's wholesale capital market lending rates, okay, that are determined globally in, in competitive, Financial markets and money markets, okay, and that's very different from um, the Jimmy Stewart banking um, that all the textbooks still take as the paradigmatic case. Ignore Jimmy Stewart banking. This is not the modern world. Don't start there. 
I tell my students, do not read Diamond and Big. Okay, it will not help you understand the modern world. Okay? I have never assigned Diamond and Big. Uh, I'm proud of that. Uh, yes. So I love Diamond and Big, but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, it's a model. Okay. We don't have, I don't have a. I don't have a worked out mathematical model of this, but there are things. Yeah, that I'll, I'll come back to that. Yeah, so, so uh, first that, I mean, Diamond and Big is essentially about um, liquidity mismatch, right? Mm -hmm. And isn't that kind of what you're getting at when you say money market funding and capital market lending, that there is sort of a maturity or liquidity mismatch between the two there, sides of the balance sheet? So there is, there is, and I'm going to show you this. Same. I'm going to show you this. And there, but there are ways in which the Diamond Divvig framework doesn't, doesn't get at the reality of what we're going to see here. I'm talking entirely financial, by the way, you're going to see. But it, whereas Diamond Divvig is talking about particular investment projects that, have, that, have, that are sort of given in their, in their time, um, I'm, this is going to be an entirely financial world that we're talking about. Exactly how this connects up to the real world, we will maybe come to at the end. I have a slide about how does this connect to development problems, for example. Uh, but this is entirely a financial world. So capital market lending, I'm talking about the bond market basically here. We're talking about the relationship between the money market and the bond market is, 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 is essentially what this is about. Um, but we'll, we'll come back to that. So market pricing is, is key there. Um, key role of market making institutions, therefore, okay, so that it's not these intermediaries that are taking deposits on one hand and making real investments on the other hand. What we, what, what we have is dealers. The key institutions in the modern world are dealers who are making markets in the money market, making markets in the bond market, and that's where those prices come from. Those prices come from dealers. These are dealer markets. Um, and the key role of central banks as a backstop for those dealer markets or the liquidity troubles, and there are liquidity troubles, most definitely. This is all going to be a story about liquidity. But it's about dealers. It's about, it's about uh, inside, inside uh, liquidity, um, as, you'll, as you'll see. These are the points that we're going, this is sort of a summary of everything we're going to do in the next hour. So uh, it's not, if it, if it seems sort of abstract and schematic, that's because it is. Um, questions? Yes. I mean, just for the people who uh, little finance backgrounds, could we just maybe elaborate on um, what's the excuse <coughs> on you know, what's the bond markets, what's capital markets, and how does that relate to GDP okay. banking? Just a little more. Um, so when I say money market, let me back up. When I say, it doesn't let you go back? <laughs> Here, okay. Um, when I say money market, um, I'm talking, uh, the, in the funding markets are typically, say, three-month markets, okay? So you're talking about an instrument that is a promise to pay $10 million three months from now, okay? Um, so you could think of it as a term de bank deposit, a euro-dollar deposit, um, but it could also be a form of commercial paper, asset-backed commercial paper. Um, but it's a, the, the term of it, okay, is something like three months. Maybe one month, maybe overnight, okay? Those are, but that's the sort of range of maturities that you're talking about in the money market. When you're talking about securities market, capital market, you're talking about the bond market. So you're talking about five years, 10 years, in the case of mortgages, uh, 30 years. These are bonds that maybe have coupons that pay once a year, maybe twice a year. Um, and uh, so they're much longer term instruments. Um, and they have uh, their prices. Are, are based on expectations of, the, of what they're going to be uh, paying over the next 10 or 20 years. Whereas in the money markets, typically the discount aspect of it is, pretty, is, is not very relevant because it's short, it's very short term. So you're not really looking very far, very far uh, ahead. Um, and so if you think of this as a term deposit, a three month, de a three month deposit of some kind or, or a commercial paper, and this is a 10 year bond, those are things to fix your Fix your ideas right right now. Okay. Um, so here here's just some data. Okay, just to show you the when, the instability part of the the talk. This is um, these are spreads. This is the difference between three months and one month. I talked talked about the money market. So this is this is a, a, a pretty standard measure of stress in the money market. Um, which is the funding, the funding market, and this is this is the crisis here. So this is this is January of seven. That's March of, of ten. So this this vertical line here is the collapse of Bear Stearns, 
This is the collapse of Lehman and AIG here. Um, and the crisis began, you can sort of see here, in August of 2007. And um, that's when I knew the crisis was happening because I was watching these spreads. I was on the beach uh, and reading the Financial Times and saying, what the hell is happening in the money market? You know, that you're seeing, what, what is this spread? This is the difference between the London, Lund, LIBOR, um, the London Interbank Offer Rate, um, which is a wholesale rate that banks borrow and lend with each other in, 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 uh, in the global private money markets, um, and the overnight index swap, which is a kind of Fed funds rate, term Fed funds rate. So it's, a, it's the domestic US uh, uh, public dollar rate, if you would. Okay? So there's a private dollar funding rate, international global rate, and there's the, the public domestic US official rate. And suddenly, and, you would th and they're both for either one month or three months, you would think that these rates should be the same. Okay? Even people who haven't had finance understand that if these rates are different, there's an arbitrage. Right, that you can borrow in the low rate and lend in the high rate and just collect the spread because they're the same rate. They should be the same. And mostly they are the same. So the spread is like zero here. Okay? And then suddenly it goes to 100 basis points, a, whole, a full percentage point. This is enormous in the money markets. Money markets move a few basis points matter. Okay, 100 basis points is, is a sign of extreme stress. Okay, so there's extreme stress throughout the, throughout the fall of 2000. Seven, and then uh, there's here's Bear Stearns, and the stress. This is this. It stays here. You can see it sort of was stabilized. We're going to see the Fed's role in stabilizing that a bit. And then it got even worse. It got even worse after Lehman and AIG. Um, and then eventually, okay, it got back down to it got down to zero here. So this is just to alert you to the 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 the, the, the way in which instability shows up in the modern global global uh, world, it shows up in the money market. It shows up in the funding in the dollar funding markets, um, and that's where that's where it is here. And these are very these are these are just extraordinary numbers, as you say. They, as you can see, they should be zero. Okay. So there's some something went wrong. You couldn't do the arbitrage, obviously. Okay. Or people saw that arbitrage and they didn't want to do it. They didn't want to borrow in Fed funds and lend and lend in LIBOR. Okay. For some reason. And that's what we need to we need to understand. That's my hand here. Was part of this also the manipulation of LIBOR? Um, this is not about the manipulation of LIBOR. We, there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, you probably would read the papers about this that the bank LIBOR they they do a survey of the banks and they say at what rate can you borrow? Okay, and banks apparently were lying about that and manipulating that. They were particularly lying on the low side. They were, during, the, during the crisis, they were saying that they could borrow at a cheaper rate than they could. So the truth is probably an even bigger spread than this, as a matter of fact. Okay, so they're, because they were trying to look a little more solvent than, than, than in fact they, they, they were. Um, uh, so this is, uh, and, and by the way, this same pattern shows up in a lot of other different rates you know, in, in, the, in, in the world. So this isn't, you can, you can depend on the qualitative, there may be a couple of basis points difference. Okay, because of this lying, but it's it's not. This is not the banks getting in cahoots and deciding. Let's 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 create this spread. So that's one. That's a sort of price measure. Here's a here's a quantity measure. This is the Fed's balance sheet during this crisis. Um, and so I'm showing assets on the vertical axis and liabilities as negative numbers on the on the uh, on the on down down here. Okay, and you can see before the crisis, the Fed was a very simple thing. This blue here is, uh, is treasury bills, mostly. Treasury's held outright. And this blue here is currency. So the Fed was a very simple thing. It had currency as a liability, and it had treasury bills as, a, as an asset. And there is a bunch of tiny little things here, like bank reserves, okay? uh, things that, you, that most people tend to think are, are the bulk. Uh, sorry, that would be a liability. Are the are the are the bulk of, of the of the uh, of the balance sheet, but it's not true. It was mostly currency. There was about fifty billion dollars worth of bank reserves, okay, um, and of the, of the banking system of the entire United States. It was a very small number, and you can hardly even see it. You can hardly even see it there. Um, it's this brown, so it's this tiny little sliver there. It's bank it's bank reserves here. Again, this is Bear Stearns. Again, this is Lehman and AIG. During as the crisis began, you can't see it on this on this. The, on the balance sheet of the Fed, but what the Fed did for the first several months of it was to lower the Fed funds rate. They lowered the Fed funds rate from 5% to 2%. It was 5% here, 
and it was lowered to 2% by Bear Stearns. That's their first attempt to deal with this crisis, is by just sort of lowering interest rates, making money cheaper, and it didn't work. Okay? You can see that at this crisis, they then kick into a different mode entirely. Okay? They sell their treasury bills, and they lend the proceeds to broker-dealers all over the world. Okay? That's what this is. The treasury bills are, are, are down to under 500 million, okay? and they're lending the proceeds to whoever needs it. Um, not just ordinary banks, not just members of the Federal Reserve System, um, all, 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 all over. Um, and then at Lehman AIG, okay, it goes even bigger. Okay, now they can't sell any more treasury bills, hardly, and so what they do is they borrow. They expand on the liability side here, um, and they double, triple the size of the balance sheet in just a few weeks. Okay? Um, and uh, I was teaching money and banking in that period, and that was a pretty interesting time. Every, every day, you know, the, the, Fed, the, Fed, the Fed publishes its balance sheet weekly okay, on the internet. So you can go on Thursday and say, so what happened last week? Okay, what, what new facility did they create? What, uh, not last week, it was a pretty interesting, interesting time. The thing I want to draw your attention to, because this lecture is about financial globalization, is this orange one here, which is the central bank liquidity swaps which at the most was $600 billion. This is the Fed uh, lending money to central banks around the world so that they could lend to their domestic banking system who had dollar assets that needed to be funded. Okay, that's sort of a chain, so let me repeat that. The shadow banking system was a, was a, is about money market funding of capital market lending. And this wasn't necessarily in the United States. A lot of it was in Europe. So if you're a European bank, and you are buying mortgage-backed securities, dollar-denominated mortgage-backed securities, and you're funding them in the world wholesale dollar markets, and suddenly there's a crisis in the world wholesale money markets, and you can't roll your funding, what can you do? You go to the European Central Bank, and you say, I need, you're my lender of last resort, and the ECB says, well, we'd love to help you, and we're happy to lend you euros, but we don't have any dollars, okay? We, we can create euros from nothing, but we can't create dollars from nothing. Only the Fed can do that. So what they did to solve this crisis, okay, is for the Fed to create dollars here and lend them to the European Central Bank, and then the European Bank lend it to Deutsche Bank or the other banks that were in trouble. Who, and, and, and so that's how the system, that's how the lender of last resort uh, worked in this, in, in, this, in this crisis. This is a new function for the Fed, um, and they really didn't want to do this. The notion that the Fed, this caused a big problem, by the way. The Bernanke, Ben Bernanke was called before Congress and asked, who gave you permission to lend 600 billion, Alan Grayson asked him, to, get, to lend 600 billion dollars, okay, to foreign central banks. And this was a teachable moment, okay, and he punted on this. Okay, he said, no, those were not loans. Those were not loans. Those were swaps in their ancient inst instruments between central banks. Well, it's true they were swaps, okay, but they were loans. Okay, they were swaps in the sense that, in, in, in the following sense, that the Fed lent $600 billion to, to the ECB, for example, and the ECB lent $600 billion worth of euros as collateral. So that's the sense in which it was a swap. But those euros just sat on the balance sheet of the Fed. They didn't, nobody needed euros, okay? They needed dollars. It was a dollar loan secured by the creation of euros from nothing. So it was a, it was a loan. But, uh, and that was a teachable moment, and that's what Ben should have said. Okay. He should have explained, let me just tell you how a swap works, okay? It's a two-sided loan, and this, he didn't educate the Congress. Uh, and uh, this is a, a very important point in, uh, for, for, this is one of the reasons I'm going around giving lectures like this, because it seems to me more people in the general public need to understand the basic facts of the global financial system in order to make reasonable policy about this. <laughs> Uh, and if you just say, we have it in hand, we're te the technocrats know what they're doing, nobody believes them. You know, look, are you kidding? The technocrats have it in hand? You know, it, it doesn't seem believable. So you need to give more, you can't just assert authority, you have to actually explain what you're doing. Okay? And uh, the Fed has been pretty good, by the way, in terms of, of revealing what its balance sheet looks like every week. Okay? There was a bit of a delay in explaining what these numbers were. They would often have obscure titles, these new, these new facilities that suddenly were, a, were, were, were $50 billion. Exactly where's that money going? Who, who exactly is getting that? It all has come out now. We know, we know all about it uh, and from Freedom of Information Act. 
um, as well, the stuff that they didn't reveal. Yes? Sure. When you um, say the loan, was there um, an interest rate or a risk premium or anything yeah, well, charged to the central bank? Because if, it's, if, if that wasn't the case, then I have a little bit of a problem with yes. the loan part. Well, we don't, that, it's a little bit hard to figure out what the interest rate was on this. Okay, because in order to make it look risk-free, they said, we're going to <coughs> exchange dollars and euros now at the current prevailing exchange rate with a promise to exchange back at this current, at, at the same exchange rate, okay, in six months from now, okay? Now, somebody <coughs> gains or loses on that, depending on what happens to the market rate. But the point is that if, if one side is doing your books in euros and the other side is doing their books in dollars, that gain or loss, you never see. You never see. Um, there was an interest rate on this, too. Um, and uh, one side is paying interest and the other side is, is, is not. Exactly what that interest is, is obscure. Okay? It, you can't see it in the, in, the, in the documents. So yes, there is some, there is some interest here. Uh, and uh, there was also, the, of course, the European banks, the banks that are on lending the funds are paying interest on this. They're paying interest at the LIBOR rate. So there, there's ultimately, ultimately what's going on is that the Fed is borrowing at zero, okay, and lending to European banks, okay, at LIBOR. That's ultimately what's going on, and it's passing through the central banks as a sort of accounting structure, so that the Fed doesn't have to do it itself. The point was that the ECB is taking the credit risk, right, and with the notion that there's no credit risk between central banks. Of course there's credit risk between central banks, but, but these are governments, these are relationships of states in a sense. Um, and so it's a fascinating, this is the kind of thing that happens in wartime. Actually, this kind of balance sheet is exactly what happens in wartime, where you're, you're, you're saying, let's, let's, let's win the war, and then we'll sort out who pays for what after, okay? And we'll just keep track, we'll just keep track. That's sort of what's going on here. You're, we'll win the war, except that it was a war to save the private financial system. <laughs> which is a little odd to use war financing mechanisms. And that's why it's controversial. That's why it's controversial. It's legitimately controversial. I personally think they kind of did the right thing. Okay? But you need to explain why it was the right thing. Okay? And not just assert what it was. And, and, and say, well, and, and, and what are we going to do differently to make sure that this doesn't become routine? You know, all, all of that. Uh, quick question. So you're, OK. Yes, sure. I'm oh, sorry. Um, so, uh, just going on that question. Um, Would you say this is, this is a, essentially the equivalent of giving the foreign banks access to the Fed discount window? Yes. That's essentially what they're doing. Yes. Okay. But with using the ECP as a cutout man. Yeah. Basically. Yeah. Sorry. You might explain what the, the green one is. Uh, it's okay, yes, the green one, okay, that's a different lecture, but uh, th this is mortgage-backed securities, okay, so the Fed, um, so it started to go into the business of actually buying mortgage-backed securities itself, and it bought a trillion dollars worth of them, okay, this is what they call QE, quantitative easing, okay, um, so these are dollar-denominated, if you got a mortgage or refinanced a mortgage in the United States during this period, okay, it was the Fed that financed it. Okay. The Fed was, was borrowing, borrowing in the money market, okay, liabilities, and it was lending to you, okay, here. Now, of course, it's, it's lending to whatever bank made you that, you know, there's, there's a chain there, but ultimately the money is coming from, from here, okay. It's, it's liabilities to the Fed that are funding, and this is a trillion dollars worth of mortgage-backed securities, um, which the Fed has never bought mortgage-backed securities before. This, so there's another, so there's two things the Fed did in this crisis that it never did before, and it, and it would have sworn up and down that it would never ever do, period, okay? And one was, you know, being international lender of last resort, you know, saving the private LIBOR market. You know, they always said, that the governors always said, okay, do what you want. You know, these are, these are relationships between adults, but we're not gonna bail you out. LIBOR is not our problem, okay? We have a domestic banking system, a domestic money supply, not our problem. It was their problem, okay, and they did, they did bail it out, okay? It was not possible to draw a sharp line at the border, border between the domestic money market and the international money market. It was not possible. And so they didn't, okay? Similarly, buying outright mortgage-backed securities, okay? The Fed bought governments, you know, government treasury bills. That, that, they didn't want to take any credit risk or anything like this, but no one else was gonna buy mortgage-backed securities. In this period, that market was completely dead. 
and the Fed, the Fed went in and made the other side of that market. And they bought mortgage-backed securities when no one else would do it. Therefore that's that's sort of and there's a long story and we could we could have an hour discussion about that but that's a different lecture I was I was thinking we weren't mostly Americans here so we were interested in the global part of that but some of us are Americans yeah. so, so I'm actually not American yeah. um, <laughs> but, but is it correct to say then that the balance sheet has become much more risky for the Fed yes sure the Fed the Fed has has much more credit risk on its balance sheet than it's ever had before and they're not happy about this. Um, and now, some of this, they, they've done stuff behind the scenes claiming that they don't have risk. So for example, again, this 600 billion, the idea was, we don't have the risk, the ECB has the risk. But you're lending to the ECB, and if the ECB has problems, then you're gonna have problems. So yeah, it sort of passes through a little bit. Similarly here, okay, the, every single one of these mortgages is guaranteed by Fannie or Freddie. Okay, and so the notion is that, that Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, some will have the risk, not the Fed. But Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac are, 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 are wards of the state. So you know, it's, it's a little bit of just making the books look good. Okay? And it depends on where you draw the boundaries of the Fed. You know, if, if you, if you, there's risk here. Yes, there's risk here. And the Fed is aware of that and, and not happy about this. This is all new stuff. They're not buying. They're not buying in the secondary market. This is almost all refinances, okay? Uh, because interest rates are zero here, okay? So that if you happen to be a good credit, okay, you can refinance your mortgage at an, at an incredible rate, okay, in this period. The effect of this, and this is another lecture, okay, was to pull <coughs> all the good credits out of these securitized mortgage pools, okay, because they refinance, okay, and put them on the balance sheet of the Fed. I say we did a good bank, bad bank split, and the good bank wound up on the balance sheet of the Fed, okay? And the, and the bad bank is still out there, okay, in these, in these mortgage security divisions. But, but it, it allowed the Fed to put a trillion dollars worth of, of liquidity into the holders of those mortgage-backed securities, because when they're refinanced, they're paid off at par. Anyway, that's another lecture. Okay, there's a, there's a lot of details there. Uh, none of which, and, and so we're obviously not going to get through these 35 slides, but uh, that's okay. Uh, we'll, this is interesting anyway, I guess. Uh, this was meant more just, these were meant to be motivating slides. So, why should you be interested in this? Okay? I don't need to motivate it. You are interested in it, obviously. Uh, so this is, uh, so I think of the time we're living in as a Badgett moment. Um, meaning, in 1873, Walter Badgett wrote this book, Lombard Street, a description of the money market. Um, in which he characterized what became known as the Badger Rule, which is in a financial crisis, the central bank can sort of put a floor on the crisis by lending freely at a high interest rate against good security, or security that would be good in normal, in normal times, okay? That's the Badger Rule. And we have a new kind of crisis, okay? This is the crisis of the global financial system, okay? And what did the Fed do, okay? And how did it do it, and what we, we're learning from, from this crisis, what is the updated version of the Badger Rule? Okay, that is needed for this, for this new system. The, the Fed did, came into this crisis with all old thinking, okay? and it improvised. And it tried this, and it tried that, and it tried the next thing. And ultimately, it did put a floor under, under this crisis. But it did not do this by lending, by being a lender of last resort to banks. Okay? That's what it was doing before Bear Stearns. Okay? It, 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 it did lots of other things. Okay? So the point is that all of modern monetary economics is built on top of this book, Badgett, okay? um, where once the central bank takes responsibility for being lender of last resort to banks, it then naturally follows, let's make sure that we don't have a financial crisis in the first place, so let's think about regulating banks, prudential and stuff, and, and oh, and by the way, maybe we should think about business cycles and credit cycles and, and manipulate the interest rate to try to stabilize the system. So all of modern monetary economics sort of follows from here. Once you take responsibility for the financial crisis, you kind of take responsibility for, for preventing instability in the first place. And so uh, it got very, 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 very refined. Okay. The problem is that the foundation, lender of last resort, is no longer kind of relevant for the modern world. Okay? And so I think this is a badge moment where we need to rethink what, what, central, what is the role of a central bank in this modern global financialized world. And once we do that, then we've got to rebuild all the other stuff, too. You've got to think about prudential regulation. You've got to think about counter-cyclical policy. All of this kind of needs to be thought through from foundations.
from foundations. Um, and, and I think that's terrific, personally. I think that's fun and interesting and intellectually challenging. Um, and it's going to keep me busy for the rest of my life. Uh, and, uh, but I, I think it's important to make this point that um, we, we have a lot of stuff in the textbooks, okay, that are just not talking about the world as, as, as it is. That it's sort of gotten its own energy, building literatures build on literatures build on literatures, and, with, and they lose track of reality as it, as, it, as, it, as it moves in another direction. So that's what I'm trying to do. So I now have a few slides, which I suppose we, I think maybe I should say, say some things about this. Um, <coughs> So we need to do monetary economics in a different way, I've said that, okay? What are the intellectual uh, obstacles to, to doing that? Um, and I'm gonna give you a little hurry up lecture here now about where, where economics came from, where finance came from, and where, where monetary economics might come from. Um, this is a picture touching the elephants, so because we're in, here in India, um, the uh, three views three views of what is happening out there in the world, okay? Um, and uh, one blind man is, is the economics profession, um, the economists, uh, who have these great texts, like Adam Smith, okay, which are thinking about the flow of income as a consequence of the parsimonious investments of the past. So the past determines the present in the sense that it's the investments of our ancestors uh, in, in ditching the fields and building factories and so forth. It's the capital stock, precious capital stock built up over many generations um, that is the source of our wealth, meaning flow here, okay, of our, of our income today, okay? The past determines the present, okay? And it's, it's sort of real, too. It's real capital investment. Much of the debate in the last 30 years in, in, uh, in economics has been trying to connect that up with, um, with almost the opposite point of view that comes from finance. The opposite point of view of finance is that the future determines the present, okay? That what, what and you're, now here we're not talking about quantities, we're talking about prices, okay? That, uh, that asset prices come from the future. Um, they're about, you know, what, is, what are the cash flows of this thing gonna be in the future, and we're gonna guess at those, and we're gonna discount them back to the present, and that's where these prices come from. And if you are able to convince people Okay, that you have a better idea, okay, you get purchasing power today. Even from not doing any saving, not doing, no parsimony anywhere, okay, you just tell a story that people find convincing, okay, and then you do your IPO. Um, and uh, so the, the, the future determines the present, okay. And a lot of the, at a sort of a, a mega, meta level, a lot of the tension. In, in, in the fighting between economics and finance has been about these very different worldviews. The future determines the present, or the past determines the, the present. <laughs> Neither one of them has been focusing much on, on money, okay? which I put as a orthogonal here, um, where the money markets, you're not, the, the, it, it is very short term. Okay? So that neither the future nor the past really matter. Okay. What matters is that I have bills to pay today, promises that I've made, and I have cash inflows that are coming from people who made promises to me, and do those things match or do they not match? Okay. And if they don't match, I need to roll over some of those promises till tomorrow okay, or the next day, um, live to fight another day, when hopefully the cash flows, the imbalances will be the other constraint, I call it, okay. which, is, which is a liquidity constraint. Um, and it's faced not just by banks, but by everybody. Okay. Everyone is a bank in this sense. Okay. You and I don't think of ourselves as banks because we have we pay banks to let us do this. You know, we have credit cards and things like that. We pay people to be the other side of that transaction, okay? And then they take it on and they make and then they have to figure out how to solve that problem. And ultimately the rubber hits the road in the daily settlement at the at the Fed. I'm gonna say just maybe a, a word or two more about that. This is a uh, capsule history of of economics. I'm not gonna use this this slide. This is too much, okay? Um, but uh, this is, uh, a lot of my life has been about this. Yeah, can you really share this slide? So we, so yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. Um, so this is sort of about uh, where, where economics came from, the attempt to put money into economics um, in the post-war period by Marshak, Patinkin, Tobit, Friedman, these, these are the main figures, by adding money supply, money demand, 
It doesn't really work in general equilibrium with Arrow de Brewer, so we wind up, that eventually shows up as getting rid of those of that whole literature, and we wind up with intertemporal general equilibrium, the DSGE model, this is the Euler equation that's the center of it, um, and, uh, and so money just sort of drops out of the, drops out of the picture there. Um, and I'm just drawing your attention. There was always still practical macro. People paid attention to the flow of funds. Um, and I'm going to come back to the, the flow of funds. OK, similarly, finance has evolved. Before the war, this finance view um, was typically the price of capital was a present value of some certainty equivalent, it was called. You know, so you have some notion of what these cash flows are going to be. But you know they're risky. And we didn't really have very developed ways of adjusting for risk. So you just said, well, certainty equivalent. Um, at, which is a sort of uh, uh, mean adjusted for risk in some ad hoc way or something, and then discounted by the, by the risk-free rate um, that you imagine is going to happen. This got developed with CAP, with cap M, giving the theory of the, of the, of, of the price of risk um, as the covariance of, I mean, this is, if you, know, if you know this stuff, it's just reminding you of it. If you don't know it, you're never going to learn it from what I'm saying. <laughs> you're going way too fast. But it's important to remind you of it if you know it, OK? Um, there was a very important article written by Fisher Black in 1970, realizing that this finance view is a, is a world without money, okay? where the important thing about the stuff that people call money is that it's a risk-free asset, not that it's a liquid asset, okay? not, not that it's a means of payment or something like that, um, but that it's, that it's risk-free. And so maybe we can do finance without any monetary economics. He thought of this, and, and all of France thought of this, as beating standard macro on the head, okay, monetary evaluationism, and they did. They defeated mo standard monetary evaluationism over the head. Practical finance, there are some resources in practical finance, which we're going to see. The economics is a dealer function. As I say, dealers are central here um, that we're going to make some use of. They, these are the resources in the past. There's just, so, so there's these two views which have always been the dominant views, for the economics view and the finance view. And the money view, which I'm not going to explain, has always been a minority view uh, in academia. Okay? It's always been a majority view in the money markets and central bankers. These are practical people. They have to pay attention to this. But it always seemed very important for economists and finance as well to abstract from these short-term liquidity pressures. They seemed like they were, they were frictions that if we're going to think about efficiency and so forth, we should just pretend that there are no such problems, OK? And so basically, economics did abstract from liquidity. And, and so does asset pricing, abstract from, the, from liquidity risk. Um, and, but there, there was an, an, a, a literature that didn't abstract from that stuff and paid, it, and paid attention to it. And here are some of the people. Uh, Morse Copeland, 1952, was the inventor of the flow of funds accounts from American institutionalism, thinking about the economy as a money flow system. Um, Minsky, you've, you've heard of Hyman Minsky probably, um, but he, you probably haven't heard that he started out with this idea of the payment constraint, the settlement constraint, which he called the survival constraint, um, as being the thing that structures uh, behavior in, in the modern financial system. Hawtrey, so this is the American school, this is the British school, Hawtrey 1919, um, fundamental in inherent instability of, of credit. Um, so that this, the, the interaction between, between credit and the real world is something that isn't stabilizing. It's not an equilibrium. It tends to fly off in, in, in two different directions. And that's why you need central banks. That's what Badgett thought, too. This is standard British central banking sort of conception of, of the world that's nowhere in modern economics, right? Nowhere, okay, intertemporal general equilibrium. Um, Hicks, um, not the Hicks of monetary Valrasianism, um, but the late Hicks, um, his last book, um, where he is saying, all that stuff I said there, uh, forget about that, okay? <laughs> it's the dealer function that is, that is key in, in understanding we should think of banks as dealers. This, I think, is deeply correct, and I'm building on, on that. Um, and then I'm referring to Badgett there, too. So these are the slides I added this morning, thinking people who haven't taken any money in banking, let me just summarize some of the features of this, of this ancient money view. Okay, that I think we need to just keep front and center in understanding the modern world that you were not taught, probably, in your money and banking class. Okay. What is money? What do we mean when we say money? What do we mean when we say banking? Okay. Usually, when we, when we say money, and we have these models where it's M, okay, and it's, it's outside money. It's some, it's some 
thing that somebody in the model is able to make more of or less of. So it's sort of like paper gold or something like this. This is not the real world. Okay? In the real world, money is transferable credit. Okay? It's, it's, it's basically all inside. Okay? It's all somebody's liability. It's a, it's a form of credit. Um, and there's two kinds of it. Okay? There's pub it's, it's a hybrid system. There's public money and there's private money. And they trade at par. And there are institutions that enable them to trade at par. Um, and they're key for understanding all of this. Probably none of these ideas have you come across in any money in banking course. They are completely standard, I, I will tell you, in people who trade the money markets, people who are actually in, in, in the world. They would just like wonder, like, why are you telling me this? Okay. It took me a long time to unlearn the economics that I have learned. Um, <laughs> living in Manhattan helps, <coughs> because you keep pumping your head up against that wall. Uh, and eventually you decide to stop the blood from flowing. <laughs> so money is transferable credit, okay? It's not paper gold. It's not fiat money or something like that. What is banking? Okay, if you take, took a money banking class, probably you think of banks as intermediaries. Savings flows through one side, investment is financed on the other side. So they're, they're intermediaries between savers and, invest, and, and investors. You know, that's not, not wrong, okay? But the banking phenomenon that we're going to talk about in the money view is this, that banking is a swap of values. Okay? That it's the bank saying, I owe you this, and then and taking in and somebody saying, no, I owe you the, uh, the, the bank this. So that's what a loan, for example, is where the bank, where, where I, 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 when I get a loan from a bank, what happens? What happens is I write a note, I owe you the bank a million dollars to buy a one bedroom flat in Manhattan. Okay? <laughs> um, and the bank says, no, I owe you a million dollars, okay? a deposit account, which I transfer to the current owner of that, of that flat. So this is a swap of IOUs, and, uh, and it's, it's, it's an expansion of the balance sheet of the bank from nothing. There's no saving. There's no saving that's happening anywhere. It's a swap of IOUs, and that enables a transaction to happen. Okay? Um, and all banking is a swap of IOUs. So I'm going to come back to this stuff here, too. These derivatives that everyone is so suspicious of, I'm sure you know, you're development people, so you are very real side biased people. Okay, and you're very suspicious of derivatives, uh, of interest rate swaps and credit default swaps and foreign exchange swaps. They seem like a tool of the devil. <laughs> Wall Street has created these things. These are very natural banking instruments. Okay? All swaps are just are really swapped by use behind the scenes. Okay? An interest rate swap is just, I pay you the long-term interest rate, you pay me the short-term interest rate. Okay? That's a swap of value use, notionally, in the back of your mind. We're just getting rid of all the actual capital and just swapping the flows. Okay? Um, similarly, credit default swap, I pay you a risky stream, you pay me a safe stream. Okay? Similarly, foreign exchange, I pay you, you rupees, you pay me, you pay me dollars. Okay? They're all swaps of IOUs. Derivatives are swaps of IOUs. In that sense, they're very natural banking instruments. Um, and we're not going to get rid of them. Okay? This is banking. We need, this is banking, modern banking. And we need to understand how they work, and how to regulate them, how to live in this world. Okay? They're not going away. Okay? They're, they're, they're not evil things that you can just ban by passing a law against them, because they're too natural. Okay? They're, and they've been around by basically forever, too, by the way, it, but in different forms um, than they are. It's very refined now, and modern finance has helped you refine them and helped you create theories of how these things should be priced and, and all of that. Um, but the banking element has been missed. <coughs> when you look, when, when many, many students, you know, if you've had a modern finance course, you've learned, you've learned stochastic calculus and all that, you learn how to price these things. But many students like this come up and they say, we never thought of them as a swap of values. Yes, basically, I'm, I'm sure you never did, because they're not taught as banking instruments. They're taught as exposure to risk and pricing and exposure to risk. They're banking instruments. And so I teach all of this to my undergraduates in balance sheets. Here's, here's, the li here's the liability, here's the asset, here's what a credit default swap is. I tried, just as a, as, a, as a pedagogical experiment, I tried teaching this to freshmen. You can teach this to freshmen. Okay? Introductory economics, balance sheets, assets and liabilities, they can understand how credit default swaps work. That means it's a teachable moment. It's possible to teach. You don't have to say credit default swaps are two, are two, because you have to know stochastic calculus. To, you don't have to know stochastic calculus to understand what they are. You might have to know it in order to price them okay, in a modern way, but you don't need to know it at all okay, in order to understand what they are. So the third thing about banking um, is understanding banks as dealers. 
money dealers. Um, and what does it mean to be a dealer? It means you're offering a bid-ask spread. Okay? You're saying, I'm willing to buy or I'm willing to sell. You tell me which way you want to go. That's what a dealer is. And that's sort of what a bank is doing on its balance sheet. Right? It's saying, um, you, you want to lend me money? I'll take in a deposit. You want to borrow money from me? Okay, I have a spread there. I have a bid-ask spread. Or when you're in more refined and derivative, okay, you, you want to go one way in a straight way swap, you want to go the other way in a straight swap, you know, we, I can do either way, okay? There's a bid-ask spread there and for all of these, so it's very refined. These are the market makers, as I said, in the modern system, that, that they're looking at how those spreads get determined, how those prices get determined. Um, oh, and here's, here's, uh, so the last image to understand the modern system, well, the last but one. Um, for economists, many of you are not, how many of you actually are economists? So about half, okay? So you're used to thinking about general equilibrium, okay? You're used to be thinking about a world in which we have N commodities, okay? It's a flat world. There's N commodities and there's relative prices between them. They're all the same kind of thing, okay? It's a flat world. Okay. Yes, it's true that some of these are children that we're buying and selling, and some of these are corn, and there's moral, you know, this is horrible, okay, morally. Um, but it's flat from the point of view of the market. You cannot get anywhere in money markets if you think in that way, okay, because it's a hierarchical system, okay. Money is transferable credit. Not all credit is transferable. So there's a hierarchy. There's a hierarchy, okay. And here's the hierarchy. So here's, here's, here's a stylized hierarchy. Um, with securities down at the bottom, uh, bank deposits, currency, and I'm putting gold there, but it could also be inside money at the international level um, as, as well. Um, and, and I think of these, all these, these uh, market makers in between as, as knitting together the layers of the hierarchy. So a bank, a bank is uh, short deposits and long currency. Okay? A central bank is short currency and long and long gold. Okay, and there's a price that they're making here. You know, when I say they're 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 long and short, these are the three prices of money: the interest rate par, that is the par between between currency and deposits. Okay, that they trade one for one, um, but that's a price. And in financial crisis, that price does not stay at one. Okay, see Argentina. Um, and exchange rates, which can be fixed exchange rates or flexible exchange rates, but so there are these three prices of money. There's also another price of money that economics mostly focuses on, of course, the price level, inflation, okay, um, which is not here here anywhere. Okay, that's the connection to the real world. Okay, which we're not going to talk about today. We're talking about how the money market works. Okay, these are these are the prices that are determined. So this is just showing you that banks are kind of security dealer, okay, but at a different layer in the hierarchy. Central banks are a kind of security dealer, but at a different layer in the hierarchy. Okay? The people at the top of the hierarchy are the ones who can create transferable credit. Transferable, more transferable. Okay? Banks can create less transferable. Security dealers can create less transferable. So it's credit all the way. The question is the liquidity, the hierarchy of, of liquidity that's going on, that's going on here. And this is an institute, a relationship of balance sheets. Right? These deposits, which are liability of the bank, are assets here. Okay? This currency, which is liability of the central bank, are assets of the banking system. So it's, it's a system of interlocking balance sheets, the whole, the whole system. Chris, yes? Uh, so what, what is sort of the, uh, I guess, value additive banking or banks, or what sort of the, what enables them to do this liquidity transformation and, as opposed to just households making deposit, lending yeah. to firms directly and so on? So let me rephrase this question. So value added. Maybe I'm putting words in your mouth, but the question always does arise for people who are economically trained. If banks are only doing swaps of IOUs, that doesn't take any real resources. So why do you make money doing this? How can you make money doing this? It doesn't seem, well, where's the value add? Okay? And the value add is a liquidity value add, but how are you doing that? You know, how are you adding, if you're just swapping IOUs, we're, we're, and, and, and there's going to be a model here that I'm going to show you, the economics of the dealer function, that explains how banks make money. And when you, when you see how banks make money, you'll see how they add value. Okay? And, and it's about creating market liquidity. It's about selling market liquidity. They're basically selling liquidity is, is what they're doing. 
um, by moving prices away from their natural rate. Okay, so there's a distortion, there's a price distortion from general equilibrium that is needed in order to make this thing go. But you'll, you'll, you'll see this. You know, I'm glad to have an economist because you, you have the right instincts about where this model, where, where this is deviating from, from, from standard stuff. And it is definitely deviating. Okay? But, but there, so there has to be answers to these questions. These are absolutely the right questions. You know, as I, I've been working on this for a long time, and I've been worrying, what is the answer to that question? Because that's a pretty devastating question. Bishop Black says there's no theory of money, there shouldn't be any theory of money. He's a smart guy, you know. <laughs> what, what, therefore, either I'm wasting my time, or there's some subtle thing there that he's missing. And where is it? Where is it? I'm going to show you where it is. <laughs> where I think it is. So here's, uh, here's two, actually, these are two other slides that are intended now to differentiate this money view from stuff that you might mistake it for, okay? Many people think that the issue of the crisis is about leverage, okay? That the whole problem was that there wasn't enough capital in the system, we need to make banks hold more capital, that it was about leverage, okay? And not about liquidity, okay? So now I just want to be clear what these words mean, or, or be, be more clear than is usual in, in, in economic discussion. When people talk about leverage, they're typically coming from, a, a, from finance, and they're comparing these sorts of balance sheets. Equity finance, it, where you're thinking about a company, say, that has, where its assets are the present value of its future earnings, okay? And it's financing itself with $10 worth of bonds and $90 worth of equity, that's equity finance. This is safe in the sense that fluctuations of the value here will be absorbed in the fluctuation of, of, of equity values here, and the bonds are pretty risky are pretty risk-free. Bond finance is riskier because if it's the same earnings and you have 90 of bonds and 10 of equity, then you could burn through that equity cushion and then the bonds become, become risky. Modiani Miller, the famous, says that if you rule out bankruptcy, um, there's no real difference between these, these two. And that's right, but ruling out bankruptcy is exactly the point, okay? That, the, uh, that, the, that you're really, that just means putting bounds on the fluctuations of, of, of here, okay? So this is, this is well understood in corporate finance and the, this whole discussion goes on, and you're imagining that somehow that is a model of understanding what went wrong with banks somehow. But what I want to show you is here, money finance, a world in which the assets are bonds and the liabilities are deposits, 90, and equity, 10. So this, compare this one with this one, okay? And the issue here is, is, is not so much the leverage, okay? That is to say 90 over 10, you know, a gearing ratio of 90 over 10, because that's the same here, the same here as, as, as there. The issue is lining up the cash flows, okay? If the issue is, is, is liquidity, that these bonds are 10-year are bonds, okay? And they pay, whereas these deposits are demand deposits and they may all flow out, there may be a cash outflow, okay, today of, 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 of all of that. So it's bonds versus money is the issue, as opposed to equity versus bonds, okay, that is, that I want to emphasize when we're talking about liquidity. And I think that's what Minsky was on about when he talked about hedge, speculative, and Ponzi, okay. People, even people who call themselves acolytes of Minsky, think that the hedge, speculative, Ponzi distinction is about leverage, okay. And I think it's not understanding it. Okay, that it's about the get lining up in time the cash inflows and cash outflows. Okay, that it's about liquidity, um, actually, and uh, the timing, the mismatch of cash inflows and outflows. That what a bank does is to deliberately mismatch. Okay, um, in order to allow somebody else to mismatch the other way. That's the whole point. Okay, and you're selling that mismatch. You're taking that risk onto your own, onto your own, onto your own balance sheet. This is a Jimmy Stewart bank, sort of, right? You know, it's taking deposits and, 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 and buying bonds. It might be even government bonds here. So they're, they're, they're risk-free government bonds, but they're not risk-free in, there's still liquidity risk in the sense that these bonds are long-term and these deposits are short-term. If you had to pay, if these are government bonds, hopefully they're saleable in liquid markets so that if this deposits did flow out, you could sell the bonds. If these are loans, you can't sell them. There's no market, okay? So now we get market liquidity, and that's what I want to talk about. So now I want to go one more. So this is the same balance sheet I just showed you about Jimmy Stewart banking. And now I'm going to show you shadow banking. Look at these two balance sheets here. 
saying a shadow bank, what is shadow banking? Slide two. Capital, money market funding of capital market lending. That's what I'm showing you here. Money market funding, so these are term deposits, or I'm putting, might be commercial paper, might be asset backed commercial paper or something, so I'm putting deposits in quotes there, okay? And bonds of 100, and I'm showing them as risky bonds, and then you're, you're insuring these with credit default swaps, so that you're taking, you're, you're, you're selling off the risk. So the, this combination is risk free, risky bonds and credit default swaps, and you're funding it in the money market. Okay, that's a shadow bank. That's what the SIVs were, that's what, that's what a lot of, they were trying to do this. This is an idealization. And over here is an asset manager, and I'm showing this asset manager as taking the opposite position in, credit, in the credit default swap market. Okay, they're taking on the risk. They have equity of 10, okay, which allows them to take on that risk. And then they are investing that equity just in the, in the money market here. This asset manager is essentially taking on the risk of the risky of the risky bonds. It's as if they held the risky bonds. Now look at these two balance sheets together. If you consolidated them, okay, that would cancel, that would cancel, and 10 of the deposits would cancel. You have exactly this balance sheet. Right? So what shadow banking is doing is taking this kind of bank and pulling it in, pulling it into two pieces, okay? Pulling it into two pieces. And the place where these two pieces connect are here, deposits. So there's a money market connection, okay? And there's a risk market connection, okay? There are prices of both of these things. This is the price of money. This is the price of risk, okay? There are market makers in both of these markets, okay? That's where the prices come from. That's what we're gonna need to focus on in understanding shadow banking, is where, is where those prices come from. Um, yeah, well, we're going to talk about that in a minute. Um, I think one more slide, is, and then we get to slide 17. Isn't that right? No, slide, yeah, okay. There's two more slides, and then I'm going to pause for five minutes, okay, <laughs> and let you absorb this. So here's two more slides, and then we'll be at lecture, uh, lecture uh, slide 18, which is halfway through, but we may not. Capital funding bank, showing you here. Money market funding of capital market lending, RMBS, is residential mortgage-backed securities. So this is the example that this is what it broke in the crisis. Can you give an example of each kind of institution? Okay. So this is, you know, this is uh, uh, residential mortgage-backed securities. So this is mortgages, household mortgages, which are packaged together into bonds, okay, which are bought by a trust, okay, Citibank set these things up, called uh, structured investment vehicles. Um, and then these are used as collateral to raise money in the wholesale money market through uh, commercial paper, asset-backed commercial paper. So this might be 30-day or three-month three -month paper that is collateralized by these assets. Meaning, if I don't pay you back, you don't have to give me back. I get to possess your securities. So it's like people understand how mortgages work, right? If you don't pay the bank, they get to take your house. But it's hard for them to take your house, okay? In the financial markets, it's easy. Okay, because often this stuff is already on your balance sheet or it's transferred or something. It's much easier. You don't have to go through foreclosure. It's, it's collateral. You own it. You can sell it. If they don't pay you back, you can, you can sell it. You don't have to go through foreclosure. Um, but it's the, the, the structure is the same. We're used, to, we're used to collateral. So I'm showing funding of this lending. And here's a global money dealer who's making money markets. They're, they're borrowing on one side and they're lending on the other. So this, as an institution, this could be Deutsche Bank, this could be the Union Bank of Switzerland. All the big global banks are in this business. Could be Goldman Sachs. So things that, not, you don't necessarily, they're not, that's why I call them global money dealers. They're not necessarily things that are legal in banks, okay? Um, and they're not necessarily in the United States. Here I have an asset manager on this side, which is the source of the capital for the whole system. So this might be a pension fund. Might be a pension fund where uh, there are pension liabilities, uh, and uh, and they are investing those in risky assets. But the way they're doing that is by buying money, by by investing them in money, and taking on all of their risk with, in these derivative ways, with credit default swaps, interest rate swaps, and foreign exchange swaps, which are here. So. 
So the, the, you can see that the pension fund okay, is the mirror image of the shadow bank. Right? Their assets and liabilities are the opposite of each other. That's just the way I've constructed it. This is, this is an idealization because we're trying to move toward a model sometime. And these, they're, they're mirror images, but they meet through the intermediation of these two kinds of dealers. One is making markets in money, and the other is making markets in risk. Okay, credit default swaps, interest rate swaps, and foreign exchange swaps. Okay, now this also could be Goldman Sachs. This also could be Lehman Brothers. Okay, so all, in fact, Lehman Brothers could also have a division that's doing this, could have a division that's doing this. When I talk to my investment banker friends, they say, you know, at Goldman Sachs, they say, but we're in all four of these businesses. I say, okay, I, I know you're in all four of those businesses, but they are, they are uh, conceptually distinct businesses. And not everyone is in all four of these businesses, and not all four of these businesses are equally legitimate of a government backstop. This is where I'm going, is try to understand what parts of these things do we want to have a government backstop for, and what parts of these things do we not. And I'm, that's why I'm carving out the dealer part, because this is the liquidity part. This is the liquidity part. This is the part where you kind of have to have a government backstop, and that's what the next slide gives. So this is the image. I mean, the actual shadow banking system was much more complicated than this. Okay, there's all this tranching and all kinds of garbage. Okay, but if you just sort of lift up from that, what was that? What was all that trying to do? That was trying to transfer risk around. Okay, and it was trying to create funding. I think this is what it was trying to do. Okay, and so the future of shadow banking might well look like this. This is sort of a simple, a simplified, mature shadow banking. Um, where you're, you're having risky securities here, and then you're carving off all the risk, selling it off separately, so that you wind up with a risk-free portfolio here. You're using that as collateral for, for funding in, in wholesale money markets globally. Um, so each one of these things could be bought by different people. You know, that's the whole point of this. I mean, I'm showing one asset manager, I'm showing one, but they could be all different people having, having all, of, all, all of these things. What kind of backstops are needed here? I'm taking a global bank and the derivative dealer, which you saw on the previous slide, the same balance sheet that they had before, and now putting in these uh, liquidity backstops. For the global, this is the one we understand. Money dealers are like banks. Okay? They need a lender of last resort, and I'm, and, I, and I'm writing this as a liquidity push because they're basically funding themselves in overnight markets and then they're lending in three month markets. Okay, that's, that's the story there. So these are maybe deposits or maybe they're overnight repo or something in, the, in a really overnight market. This is really true, by the way. There are just trillions and trillions of dollars that roll over every day, overnight, overnight money markets. Trillions, of, this is where all the liquidity is. In the crisis where there was no liquidity in three months, you could still roll your balance sheet in the overnight market. And that's what everyone did who survived, okay, was they rolled their balance sheet in, in the overnight market. So this is what the, so the, this is lender of last resort. This we understand. This is the new part, okay? And this is the part that the Fed went, wound up having to do in the crisis, that there's a risk dealer system, okay, that's creating prices of risk, prices, prices of, of, of maturity risk, of duration risk, of, of FX risk, of, of credit risk. And the kind of liquidity backstop they need I call a, a liquidity put, a market liquidity put. Because it's about the saleability of the underlying instruments. You know, if you need to sell this risky bond in a hurry, uh, what price can you get for it? Well, the price you get for it is the price of a risk-free bond plus the price of all these risks. Okay? And if nobody is putting a floor on the price of these risks, okay, these, these prices can get way out of whack. So that's market, market liquidity. And that's basically when the Fed, when somebody asked me about what is that big green thing, okay, this is the Fed trying to put a floor on the, on the price of, of mortgage-backed securities okay, um, and, and keep them from going to zero. Okay, and uh, by, by buying itself, entering as a dealer outright. So the logical consequence of thinking about the world in this way is to say, is to think about central banks in this way, that there has to be a central bank counterpart for these, these things that are, that are off balance sheet, you know, implicit, implicit assets, and here are implicit liabilities of, of, of the central bank, uh, of the modern central bank. 
um, that came into the money in the crisis. So they showed up on the balance sheet of the Fed in the crisis, and you can see them. There's a there's a there's a one-to-one -one match between this picture and the and the picture of the Fed's balance sheet that I showed you before. But you have to do some rejiggering and understanding it as swaps of IOUs in order to in order to see that. I can show that to you, or I can stop here, or maybe that's the last place to. Let me. I had that later on in the lecture. Let me sh let me fast forward and show you that, yeah. and then stop, and see where you want to go with this. All the rest of the slides are about regulate how how to regulate a system like this. And to that, you need a model of dealers. You need lots of other stuff. So let me find the Fed's balance sheet slide. There's the Fed balance sheet slide. So this is what the Fed's balance sheet looked like. The Fed, the, the Central Bank of the United States. Um, this is what it looked like December 15, 2011. So sort of after the worst of the crisis, but everything is still on the balance sheet. Okay? They haven't, they're talking about exit strategy, but they're not succeeding. And what it looked like was they had $1.7 trillion of treasuries as assets, about $0.9 trillion of, of mortgage-backed securities, and, and bonds issued by Fannie and Freddie, so I'm lumping those together, GSEs, um, those are. And then $0.3 trillion of other stuff. And their liabilities were currency, about a trillion, which is what it was before the crisis, and this 1.6 trillion of excess reserves. As I said, before the crisis, it was 50 billion. 50 billion to 1.6 trillion, okay? So this is where all of the expansion on the liability side came. Now what I am, and so how does that line up with the categories that I just showed you? Well, it kind of doesn't until you do some rearrangement. And here's the rearrangement on this side. What I've done here, is to, uh, where do we start? Start with, these are risky securities here, 0.9, okay? And match them, and they're long-term securities. So, so imagine that you have a long-term, uh, you have a long position, meaning an asset, okay, in risky securities. This 0.9 is the same as that 0.9. And then match it with a short position in a long-term treasury bond, a risk-free security. So this is a 10-year treasury bond or a 30-year treasury bond. Add it to the other side too, okay, so that you're not messing up your balance sheet here. And and I'm thinking of these things were all long-term, we're, we're all short-term secure. What am I doing here? So I'm adding 0.9 to 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 that and getting 2.6, and then I'm adding tre treasury bills on this side and on this side, both. Uh, and then I'm adding up currency and reserves to give 2.6 trillion here. So I've added this on both sides, and I've added this on both sides, um, and I haven't actually changed the net of anything, okay? You, if, you, if, if you have a long position and short position in the same instrument, they net out. But now look at what you're seeing here. What is this? A long position in risk and a short position in a risk-free, same maturity, this is a credit default swap. Okay. A long position in a treasury bond and a short position in a treasury bill, what is that? That's an interest rate swap. And what is this? Okay. This is an overnight index swap, okay. where you have a long position in, in three-month bills and a short position in money. Okay. This is an overnight index swap. Okay. This is the funding liquidity piece. These are the market liquidity pieces. The Fed did in the crisis. The consequence of improvising in the crisis was to create a balance sheet okay, that looks exactly like that. Okay. Here I'm putting them as derivatives, so they're all on one side of the balance sheet instead of the swap of IOUs, okay, which I did in the in the in the actual, okay. so the, the the notional. So that's the, sort of the the bottom line there. That in the crisis, the central bank has wound up discovering that the modern world requires it in crisis to do something that it never thought about doing before. Okay, which is backstopping risk markets, okay. backstopping risk dealers. And you can see that whether the Fed knows it or not, whether the Fed admits it or not, whether Ben Bernanke will admit it to Congress or not, okay, it shows up on the balance sheet. You can, you can see it there. This is what they've actually done. Whether they understand it or not, whether they're willing to admit it or not, this is what the crisis has forced them to do, and it worked. Okay, after fashion, it's not like we're out of the woods, okay? And, and the ECB is doing a similar thing, by the way. 
Okay? If, you, if you think about the balance sheet of the ECB and what's going on, they're doing a similar thing, but not with mortgage-backed securities, but with peripheral sovereign debt. So it's, different. it's a different asset class, but it's a similar operation. We are at a budget moment. Central banks are creating a new kind of backstop, and this is going to have consequences for the way we think about monetary economics for the next century. Unless it all melts down and we have a great <laughs> depression. But I don't think we will, and I hope we won't. I think, I hope, I think what everyone in this world should hope, what everyone in this room should hope, is that we figure out how to make financial globalization work. Because the alternative, you don't want to think about. No, that, that, that is worldwide depression, I think. Uh, and we can return to status quo ante, but it won't be pretty. Uh, so let me pause here. And if you want to go, if you want me to talk more about regulatory implications and things like that, I can. But maybe this is enough. I think there will be lots of questions right now. Yeah. Already, so. yeah. One from you. Yeah. <laughs> two, two from me. But yeah. So, or sorry, let, let, let me be glad to defer. I was just looking at you because you had said that. Did, was, was there, did you have a question? Where was it? Yes. I mean, I already have several, so. <laughs> Um, so I guess two questions, and you can decide you know, which answer or how to answer. So first, in terms of um, kind of all this uh, financial innovation and these uh, shadow banking and so on, would you say that a lot of that was about regulatory evasion, or was it more about um, like new still having new ideas or new demands of financing? And then, do I have to choose between those? Can I give you a third? No, it's, it's the, what's the okay. Point? okay, yeah. So if you have a better idea, that's also an answer. Yeah. And should I say the second question then? Yeah, yeah. Okay. The second question is, um, so you talk a lot about balance sheets of banks and the government, but where do balance sheets of, of like firms and households fit in in terms of kind of the aggregate thinking about everyone's obligations and IOUs and so on? Mm -hmm. um, so the first one to just th this is this is the way the way you phrase the question is the way the conversation happens in the world right now. Okay, that there are some people who say oh, shadow banking was just regulatory evasion, it didn't add any value, it's just, and all we really need to, and they, there are consequences of that then for public policy, all we really need to do is just to push the regulations onto shadow banking and it'll probably just go away, okay, because, and that'll be a good thing too, okay. It was, it was all just uh, regulatory arbitrage. And, th and that tends to be the economists who say that, okay. And then the finance people say, oh no, this was incredibly efficient new way of gathering funds and, and it added value and it's old fashioned banking and Jimmy Stewart and it added all this value. And so really we should just get rid of traditional banking and, and have only shadow bank. And you can see that I'm imagining a world in which there is only shadow bank. Right? That's what that picture is. That's a world of only shadow banking because I think we need to think about that world in order to think it, that if we had a world of only shadow banking, it does not follow that it doesn't need regulation. It, what follows from that is it may need a different kind of regulation than in a world without any shadow banking. That's where I'm coming from. I'm saying I do, th and so, so my answer to your question is, is box three, okay? That I think that what was driving shadow banking is in fact financial globalization. That it is, it is the characteristic institutional form of, of, of financial globalization. And that because if you're talking about a global market, you're talking about funding in a global market, you're talking about, uh, and, and the securities have to be saleable in a global market. They have to be securities. They can't be loans. You can't, you know, whole loans. It has to be something more bond-like than that. It has to be a security of some kind. So this is the natural institutional structure for financial globalization. That's what I think actually is driving the whole thing. Now, that is not to say that there isn't truth in the other points of view. Certainly there is regulatory arbitrage and evasion, okay? And, and, and certainly, I think probably some of, the, some of the new innovations do probably make things more efficient. I, so I say, okay, both of you are right, okay? But both of you are wrong in the sense that I think that the notion that, that we don't need any regulation is silly. You're not understanding, you're not understanding this as a banker would. Okay, you're thinking about this as a finance person would. And you're saying there's a market clearing price, what's wrong with that? Markets are efficient by assumption, you know, and, 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 and liquidity we have, we have just basically pushed out of our market, uh, out of our model. We've assumed that somehow all markets are liquid, liquid at the efficient price. That's how finance works, okay? Well, they aren't always liquid at, at, at the efficient price, and that's what we've seen in the, in the crisis. Um, and that's why central banks backstopped. 
So I have a, I have question, the, so that's a long answer, but it, 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 is a, it is really a criticism of the way the question is posed, not by you, but by in, in the larger conversation. Okay, I, I want to just say, you're not really thinking about this right. And this is true with all the regulators. They're battling, you know, you're in favor of the banks, you're against the banks. You know, this is not a very helpful way of thinking about what the issues are. Second question is, how does this link up with the real, with the real economy? Um, and there, I think there's work to be done. I, I am not, I'm not able to say too much about that right now. Um, there, what I am insisting, and, and, and I, and I, and I want to maybe say that's a bit of a virtue, that there is a logic to the financial system by itself. That the stage of modern capitalism that we're in is, is financial capitalism. And that trying to, trying to say we don't know anything until we link this back to the real economy is, I think, not appreciating that the financial system has its own inherent logic. And perhaps this is the dog, OK, and the real system is the tail, for better or worse. I'm not saying that it's a good thing. I'm just saying this is positive economics, OK, that this is sort of how it's, how it's happening. Maybe I should show you my last slide on the consequences for development. That's where that will come from. But let's, let's get a few more questions, and then I'll show that. Yes? This is like a half-baked question, I think, and um, I have my cat. I used to be a Wells Fargo banker, so underwriting. There's always one in the room. <laughs> <laughs> so, so underwriting it and understanding like the risk and and thinking about like actual asset values is obviously important to someone in yeah. my former profession. Um, so thinking that through, and I really I really appreciated your diagram that talks about about the intersection between time. Tables, right, and thinking about what's going on with future, past, and, and actual present. And the thing that I've been continually unable to understand is what the nano trading is doing in the shadow banking and how fast time has high frequency sped trading. Up. High frequency mm -hmm. trading has sped up the the market reaction time, so that mm -hmm. someone that's in my that might be sitting in my office trying to actually understand value of assets. The, the, the trade that, that mismatch becomes, in, it makes the entire system so unstable. And so then I keep trying to think, oh, what's the, what are the regulatory mechanisms? What are the sort of, is there any equilibrium whatsoever anymore? Because it, it, it moves so fast, I can't keep up with it, right? Even, or even thinking about like a pension fund or a private equity fund that's trying to manage large, large pools of assets, right? So I guess sort of, how do, we, how do we think about that in terms of from the central bank role and from the sort of yeah. overall system instability? Well, you've sort of, you've, you've raised one of the most important, I think, issues for a regulatory, uh, and, and, and how do we begin to think about that? I think the, the way to think about that is, is, is here, to think about where is the HFT happening, high frequency trading? A lot of it is FX trading. Okay, and what is FX trading? It's 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 both, you know, uh, FX swaps. So it's taking care taking care of moving this risk around. Okay, and it's also moving money around. Okay, in, in, in internationally, they tend to be done by the same the same people. There's also um, high frequency trading in in equities. Okay, there tends not to be so much HFT in uh, in in bonds. Okay, um, I'm not exactly sure why that is, but it but these are just the facts of. of world, I gave you a picture of the world in which the dealers are all entities, you know, that, that they're security dealers, and that's a balance sheet, okay, and that there's a bank that is a dealer in the money market, and it's a balance sheet, and a central bank is a, is a balance sheet. These HFTs are not balance sheets, typically, meaning they are in and out of the market during the day, okay, and they're flat at the end of the day, and they're flat at the beginning of the day. They are not actually dealers in the sense that they're holding positions that they're financing, that they're taking the opposite side of some market imbalance. Okay? So the debate is about, are they really adding liquidity, as a dealer would, okay? or are they subtracting liquidity? Are they, just, are, they, are they actually just sucking, and they're certainly sucking profits out of the banks. And the consequence of this has been a widening of the bid-ask spread, which has been sort of bad for you and me. Okay? This is the kind of argument that people, that people make about this. Um, And maybe we should throw some sand in the gears and not allow people to close out positions during the day or something that if you take a position, 
it's very difficult to imagine how you can do this, and it's offshore, and it's trading between adults, and that sort of thing. But it is, it is the, the, the way I address it is, about, is, is by thinking about uh, collateral and payment, by thinking about um, when you take a position in risk, okay, what happens, there's collateral associated with that. If you had to put up collateral, if you had to put up collateral every time you took a risk position, okay, um, that would which that would change the world, for example. Um, and I think a, a, a lot of the reason HF, HFT is avoiding the kinds of fixed costs that banks have, okay, by doing that, by by avoiding by never having to make a payment because they they're flat at the end of the day when they, when everything settles. So rules about collateral could could be appropriate there, but. The problem with Dodd-Frank, and the problem with all its regulation, is that they tend to see a lot of little problems, and they're thinking about little fixes for each one, instead of having a picture of the system that you're trying to create. That's what I'm trying to, I mean, I'm actually, there's a paper here about, called Badgett was a Shadow Banker, okay, that is an attempt to sell this and say, this is what the world is trying to be, okay, let's help it be that, okay, and help it be stable. You know, help help put bounds on a system like this. So this said, and then you understand why you're concerned about HFT. You have a, it's not we don't care that they're taking money away from banks. Okay, there's no social reason to care about that. Maybe they're just the future of banking. You know, and they're the future dealers or something. We need dealers, and we need to backstop dealers. But are H is HFT dealers or are they not? Okay, maybe they're not. Maybe they're not dealers. Maybe maybe they're just traders. Okay, so I I, I want to give to the. We, I mean, there's lots of questions. I want to give uh, the opportunity for two more questions and then we'll stop because we're over time, but I want, okay. I think we've got to go to my this, last slide, too. No. Go ahead. Okay. This may be slightly, slightly more general, um, what kind of relates to the last two questions. Uh, I'd just like your opinion, which give some kind of support for whether you think the old system, as your Jimmy Stewart Banking, is uh, inherently more uh, stable compared to the uh, the shadow banking system that we, that we see today. And I guess I would like to relate that to how this either system responds to uh, risk. Okay, let, let's just so, take any one, one more question, if there's any. Okay, I'm going to ask the question then very quickly. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm not going away also, you can ask. Sure. <laughs> okay, let's let, let the, I, I'll ask you, sir. that's okay, I think that's All right. Enough. So let me, the, um, huh? so the question was, um, is the old system, what I call Jimmy Stewart banking, um, sort of naturally more stable than this shadow banking, or what? Okay. My position on this is that credit is inherently unstable. Okay. The old system was inherently unstable, the new system is inherently unstable, both of them are inherently unstable, but in different ways. The way this shows up is, 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 is different, and therefore the way, the way, the reason you think the old system is stable was more stable is because it had a whole regulatory apparatus that was built around it, okay, that made it stable. It certainly was not inherently stable, okay. It was it was created to be to be stable through learning over centuries uh, about about how to do that. We're at the very beginning of that learning process for the new system. Okay, I would emphasize though that the new system. I, I do want to emphasize that the new system is inherently unstable because the, many of the people who built it have this ideology of finance. That imagine that it's equilibrium or something, that prices can just move and create equilibrium all the time. No. No. From a banking point of view, this is just not really right. You're, you're not, because you've abstracted from liquidity problems, you've abstracted from instability. You know, yes, sure, if you didn't have liquidity problems, you could maybe have, have that. But you are going to have liquidity problems because it's a banking system, okay? You are going to have this problem, and you need to figure out what kind of backstops uh, are needed for the modern system. The modern system is much more unstable than the old system. But the old system is dead. It's, it's gone. Half of credit in the United States flows through this kind of, the, that kind of, the new system. You know, it's, it's the marginal credit is all in the, new, in, the, in the new system. And so this is the system we need to be thinking about and not be nostalgic for the world of the 50s. Okay? We're not going back there. And if we try to, we're just going to create opportunities for regulatory arbitrage. And that's sort of what Congress is doing. It's actually pushing us faster to the new system by trying to close the barn door, trying to really make the traditional system very, very safe and therefore very uneconomic. <laughs> and so it's going away. Traditional banking is going away more rapidly, okay, because of the attempt to regulate that has come from this from this crisis. Um, I want to say a word just while I still have the floor. Uh, 
we can well we can talk about that about um, INET. Okay, this is this is the uh, uh, this is the web page that we set up in, in Ning, which and the, and the point of this, and I see only 19 of you have actually signed up here. Okay, <laughs> so I know this. Okay, I see this, and you haven't given us your pictures either. Okay, um, and the people who have given the pictures are almost all women. I'm not sure. I'm just pointing facts here. Um, what this all means. The, the, re the reason we set this up is with the idea that you may want to be in communication with each other before the winter school, but maybe also after the winter school. That here's a place where you can uh, do whatever you want. And it's a, it's a much larger, you'll see there's other groups there, and you can get involved in them, or lurk, or watch, or whatever. Other groups, reading groups, that are, that are studying various things. And you can set up ones of your own. This is what INET wants to be. We want to be a platform to facilitate the creation of new economic thinkers, and that means you, okay? That means you, okay? The future of economics depends on you, and so don't let us down, please. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and this is the pipeline that we're trying to support. You're sort of here, okay? And then, but we're also interested in postdocs and assistant professors and young tenured, so as you look forward in your life, INET, our, our goal is to be there at every moment, okay? Is to be there at every moment, and we're building programs for each one of these moments. So the INET Online University, which we're, which we're building, is really mainly for students, Young Scholars Initiative, um, but we also have grant programs and, and, and research programs. So this is what INET is trying to do in our strategy to help. This is the last slide here. Um, the INET Online University, I think anyway, uh, as, as, as a sort of central piece of this, um, where we're uh, at, but it's a virtual university, okay? And it, it exists right now, sort of on name. Okay? That, this is the, that this is the place where scholars and uh, where students and, and, and teachers are interacting um, and building community and, and, building, and building the educational system of the future. Um, you will notice that one kind of interaction that was on that is right here. This is the paper, my paper, that was posted on your website. So this is an example of communication. It's sort of awkward, but it's, it's just posting a paper. But uh, we'll try to get more sophisticated. Um, and uh, this is, and then there's face to face, which is which is this. We really also believe that the future is not all virtual. Okay, it's a it's a hybrid, just as money is a hybrid, public private. You know, the future is a hybrid, virtual and face to face. Sometimes it's important to get on a plane and fly halfway around the world. Okay, to give a one and a half hour lecture. <laughs> through lunch, so please try and find time to speak with them. Also, Ning and the uh, online stuff. At the end of this, try to think of ways in which you'll make your own groups continue uh, past this, all right? I'm sure you would.